Hello everyone. Welcome to this RSET webinar series on monitoring coastal and estuarine water quality, transitioning from mode to wares. Today's session will be on overview of remote sensing observations for water quality monitoring in estuaries. I am Amita Mehta and this training will be conducted along with me by Juan Torres Perez and Sean McCartney from RSET. Overall training objectives are to recognize the importance of coastal and estuarine waters and why they should be monitored for water quality. Give examples of water quality indicators that satellites can observe. Identify current satellite data that is useful for water quality monitoring and specifically process MODIS and WIRS imagery using CDAS to obtain water quality parameters. Finally, apply these techniques for water quality monitoring in coastal and estuarine regions. Note that MODIS and WIRS are both sensors. MODIS is moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer that has been flying since early 2000 and provides water quality monitoring capabilities since then. Now MODIS is near to the end of its mission, but it is important to continue these observations. And that's why WIRS, which is Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, is important. It was first launched in 2011. Even after MODIS ends, WIRS will continue to provide similar watch quality parameters at comparable resolution to extend the time series started by MODIS. And CDAS, or CWIFS Data Analysis System, it's a software package that was developed by NASA Ocean Biology Group. It was first developed when CBIF mission launched to observe ocean waters. There is a prerequisite for this webinar. Fundamentals of Remote Sensing Session 2C that focuses on aquatic remote sensing. And the link is provided here. This is required to easily understand the concepts presented in this webinar. This is the overall format of the training. There will be three sessions, each one and a half hour long, including questions and answers. It will be offered both in English and Spanish. The morning sessions will be in English and the afternoon will be in Spanish. The first one today is on overview of remote sensing observations. Next, we will have image processing with CDAS and then we will focus on monitoring MODIS and WIRS based water quality for selected coastal and estuarine regions. RSET has offered a number of water quality trainings in the past. And here is the information that is specific about coastal ecosystems and coastal oceans, these two. Also, there are an introductory and advanced webinar on harmful algal bloom monitoring, also available from these links. There will be one homework assignment that will be available at the end of the series on September 21st. And the due date for the homework will be October 5th, and it will be submitted via Google form. A certificate of completion will, will be available to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. The certificate will be sent by Marinas Martins in a couple of months after the training is over. Today's outline is provided here. We will start with a brief introduction to RSET. Then we will have background about coastal and estuarine water quality. Then talk about remote sensing and water quality, current satellites and sensors relevant for monitoring water quality. And finally, we will have a demonstration of how to acquire data from MODIS and WIRS that we will be processing in the subsequent sessions. So RSET provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, and tools. 
are the trainings are online currently, but there are also in-person trainings. These trainings are open to everyone and anyone. Live instructor-led or self-guided trainings are available. Recordings of all the trainings are available online for later review. They are tailored to those with a range of experience in remote sensing from introductory to advanced. So all kinds of trainings are provided in the themes shown here, that is disasters, health and air quality, land management, and water resources. Here is the RSET website where all the information about RSET trainings is available. Now we'll start with a brief background of coastal and estuarine water quality. Coastal water is the interface between terrestrial environments and open oceans. It is connected to terrestrial waters, estuaries and bays, sounds, harbors, rivers, and inlets, coastal waters is a specific, special category because it's not fresh water, it's not open ocean water either, and specifically includes upwelling areas where water comes from, comes up from beneath. Specifically, an estuary is a partially enclosed water body. Fresh water from rivers and streams mixes with salt water from the ocean. As you can see in the picture, this river, it brings fresh water in the ocean. It's a transition from land to sea and it is influenced by tides, but it is protected from full force winds from the ocean waves, winds and storms by the land forms. Coastal and estuarine regions support a variety of habitats, including shallow, open waters, river deltas, and tidal pools, freshwater and saltwater marshes and swamps, sandy beaches and rocky shores, mud and sand flats, seagrass meadows, mangrove forests, coastal wetlands, kelp forests, coral reefs, and oyster reefs. A number of habitats are supported, making them very important biologically. Globally, Canada has the longest coastline in the world. The top 10 countries are ranked here in this table. The length of the coastline are provided in kilometers for these countries. The next longest one after Canada is Indonesia and then Norway and the United States here is 8th. There are about 1,300 estuaries globally, and these regions play a very important role in the global economy. They provide a habitat and breeding ground for thousands of species, including commercially important ones. That's why they are very important for economy regionally as well as globally. They provide coastal protection against wave action, provide sustenance for millions of people worldwide. They're important for conservation and cultural heritage, and they are very popular as recreational areas. So, so why monitor estuarine water quality? We just saw that a variety of ecosystems are supported by estuaries and also coastal waters. Estuarine ecosystems are particularly sensitive to a delicate balance between fresh water and salt water. The physical, chemical, and biological indicators of estuarine water quality are constantly in flux because of the mixing of fresh water from the land with the saline water of the coastal regions. Degrading water quality endangers aquatic plants, animals, and marine organisms. Monitoring water quality allows us to understand how to mitigate the impact of land use change, eutrophication, and contamination in estuarine systems. The schematic shown on the right hand side shows physical, chemical, and biological processes interacting in estuaries. As you can see, sediments, nutrients, and toxic pollutants wash into the coastal and estuarine regions from land, either by runoff or through river and other streams, 
and they affect ecosystem CDSU. Increasing nutrients and sediments in coastal waters is a major concern worldwide. It leads to low dissolved oxygen in the water or leads to hypoxia, a major cause of destruction of benthic organisms and fish. The figure shown here from Water Resources Institute shows these red areas, these are dead zones, which are suffering from coastal hypoxia and eutrophication. There are more than 750 sites where hypoxia is monitored worldwide, and more than 550 sites showed hypoxia or less dissolved oxygen in coastal regions as shown in, in these red areas. To monitor water quality, coastal and estuarine regions, there are some indicators which are measured and they are listed here. That's water temperature and salinity or pH, dissolved oxygen, nitrogen and phosphorus, chlorophyll A concentration and turbidity. And these give indications to how sustainable the estuarine regions is for ecosystems. There are major factors that affect coastal and estuarine water quality. There are factors listed here such as coastal runoff because of weather, mechanical damage, illegal dumping of waste plastic and chemicals, and introduction of invasive species. These are all local factors which can affect water quality in estuaries. There are also large scale factors. The climate effect that impacts water quality, that's occurrence of extreme events, sea level rise, ocean acidification, sea surface and global temperature changes, changes in ocean currents, and new and or increased diseases. All these factors can impact water quality of coastal and estuarine waters. You can see an example here. It's the pollution resulting from Hurricane Florence in North Carolina. As seen here, the rivers, rivers and streams bring polluted water as runoff increases because of rain that is brought by Hurricane Florence. These are the dark areas. Examples of some in-situ water quality parameters are given here. In the United States, Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. Geological Survey, and NOAA, they collect water samples and measure some of these quantities. And going through the list here, it's water temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, alkalinity and pH, water color, nutrients such as nitrogen, tests for specific pollutants such as industrial organic compounds, heavy metals, colored dissolved organic matter, suspended solids, which cause turbidity, bacteria such as E. coli, water clarity, cyanobacteria pathogens and pathogen indicators, algae producing toxins, plastic microbeads, chlorophyll and other pigments. Some or all of these parameters are measured in C2. But as we saw earlier, there are long coastal regions in the world and a large number of estuaries. Not all of them have in situ observations. And that brings us to remote sensing of water quality monitoring uh, in uh, estuarine regions. So why use remote sensing for monitoring water quality? As you can see in these two figures in California, this is South Monterey Bay. The sampling sites in this figure shown in red and yellow marks. That's where water quality is monitored. But as you can see, large areas are unobserved and it's very sparse in this area. Whereas in this image, there is continuous coverage everywhere in the bay. Remote sensing has regular and consistent observations and they cover a large area. There is consistent revisit rate for well-structured time series analysis. Usually large numbers of data products are available and they complement in-situ sampling data and they are mostly free and open access. 
So these are some of the advantages of using human sensing data for water quality monitoring. Not all in situ parameters that we saw earlier can be seen from satellites, however. There are in situ parameters that satellite can provide indication of, such as water temperature, that is sea surface temperature from satellite, color dissolved organic matter, which is absorption of seed oil from satellite, suspended solids or perturbidity uh, from satellite, they are measured as diffuse attenuation of light at 490 nanometer. Water clarity uh, can be indicated by chlorophyll A and normalized fluorescence line height from satellites. Cyanobacteria from cyanobacteria index, which is based on multiple parameters from satellites. Algal pigments can be from euphotic zone depth and phytoplankton functional type algorithms. So these are some of the in situ parameters they map to these satellite indicators. What satellites actually measure is light coming from water surface and also from the atmosphere. First, look at this figure. This is for open ocean and this is for coastal regions. Different wavelengths from blue to red have different penetration depth. In coastal regions, because of the presence of more nutrients and sediments, light gets absorbed quickly by about 50 meters of depth, then there is no light below that, as you can see. In open ocean, relatively better water quality is there, and so the light can penetrate much deeper in up to about a couple of hundred meters. Also note that different wavelengths have different absorption characteristics and these depends on optically active material in the water. This figure depicts how light interacts with atmosphere and water before reaching satellites. Some of the sunlight reaching the water surface is reflected back from the surface, some penetrates in the water, some of it gets absorbed and scattered and transmitted back from the surface depending on the water quality. Then it goes through the atmosphere where it, it is scattered again by gaseous molecules, clouds, and aerosols in the atmosphere. When satellite measures light, it is affected by what is in the water as well as what is in the atmosphere. In fact, atmosphere has a big role to play. Almost 80% of the signal reaching the satellite comes from the atmosphere. In summary, uh, it is the optical property of water that is measured by satellites and that indicates water quality. Basic measurements by satellites is water leaving wavelength dependent reflectance, which is a fraction of water leaving radiances to downward in radiances at the water surface. How light is reflected is affected by the water optical properties depending on absorption and scattering by phytoplanktons, non-algal particles, sea domes, and water itself. The remote sensing reflectance then are used to retrieve water quality parameters. Because of the inherent optical properties of water, water color indicates water quality. For example, water itself appears blue, chlorophyll appears green, indicating the presence of phytoplankton, non-algal particles or sediments appear brown, and sea dome looks dark as shown in this figure. As shown in this spectrum, in optical wavelengths, different water quality parameters absorb at certain wavelengths, affecting water living reflectance at different different wavelengths, and these information can be used to derive water quality. Some water quality indicators observed from remote sensing are sea dome, SSD, chlorophyll A, salinity, total suspended solids, fluorescence, line height, euphotic depth, and diffuse attenuation of light. A range of colors 
and presence of chlorophyll A, sediment and sedum can be seen in this image as Suwani River, known as Blackwater River, brings pollutants into Gulf of Mexico. This brings us to current satellites and sensors that can be used for monitoring water quality. Here is a list of satellites which are currently flying with these sensors on board. All these sensors are basically optical sensors, all observing deflectance invisible to near infrared wavelengths and in some cases thermal infrared wavelengths. Starting with Landsat, Current missions are Landsat 7 and 8 with enhanced thematic mapper and operational land imager respectively. These sensors have swath size of 185 kilometers and special resolution of 15 to 60 meters depending on bands and that's nominally 30 meters. The temporal revisit time is 16 days. Aqua and Terra carry MODIS and SUMI National Polar Partnership and Joint Polar Satellite System carry visible and infrared imaging radiometer weirs. Both sensors have much broader swaths, uh, 23-30 kilometers for MODIS and 3,040 kilometers for weirs, respectively. Both have modded spatial resolution. MODIS has resolution ranging from 25 meters to 1 kilometer and wheels with 375 to 750 meters. Both have quick and temporary revisit time of 22 days. In addition, Sentinel 2A and 2B and 3N and 3B are European Space Agency satellites currently flying with sensors such as multispectral imager and ocean and land hover instrument OG. MSI has swath width of 290 kilometers, somewhat wider but comparable to Landsat, and but has somewhat higher special resolution, nominally 20 meters, and revisit time of 5 days. Sentinel-3 satellites with OLG has swath width of 1270 kilometers and moderate special resolution of 300 meters and revisit time of 27 days. These satellites have different temporal coverage as shown here. Landsat 7 and 8, they cover the period from April 99 to present. Terra and Aqua are also, uh, they also provide observations since December 1999. SNPP and JPSS were launched in November 2011 and 17 respectively. And the Sentinels are more recent missions with Sentinel-2 covering June 2015 to present and Sentinel-3 covering from February 2016 to present. These are all the satellites with water quality monitoring capability. Also, there are future missions planned for continuity and improvement of water quality monitoring. PACE, which is Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem, is scheduled to be launched in 2023. It will have Ocean Power Instrument OCI and Advanced Optical Spectrometer with Hyperspectral Measurements. Surface Biology and Geology or SBG mission is in its initial phase of development. That will also carry a hyperspectral imagery from visible shortwave infrared spectrum, visible to shortwave infrared spectrum and will also have thermal infrared bands for sea surface temperature sensing. It is worth noting that all the current sensors we reviewed have medium spectral resolutions. Here is a quick comparison of spectral bands of the sensors which are currently flying. Note that all sensors have bands from visible to near infrared wavelengths. Particularly, both MODIS and WIRS have very similar spectral bands. This is important as WIRS will continue MODIS time series even after MODIS is no longer available. 
It is important to monitor water quality in coastal and estuarine regions on multiple time scales because in short term, say days to week, water quality variations result from weather events such as storm runoff and anthropogenic causes such as industrial runoff and septic tank leakage. And multi-year water quality changes are related to climate effects such as sea level rise, increasing temperature, and land use changes such as urbanization and agricultural practices. To understand and mitigate water quality variations on short time, observations with higher temporal frequency are required and at the same time, long time series required to monitor um, interannual and longer time variations of water quality in coastal and estuarine regions. This figure on the right hand side shows dead zones in worldwide coastal and estuarine waters per decade. It's, here is 1910 decade all the way to 2000 to 2007 and these are cumulative number of uh, dead zones and as you can see the number of dead zones uh, increase um, as from about 25 in 1910 all the way to close to 400 in uh, between 2000 and 2007. These are the zones where ecosystems are not sustainable. For long-term monitoring, several current missions can be considered. Landsat 7 and 8 are available for 20 plus years, but Landsat time series started in 1972, so actually these data are available for almost 15 years. Terra and Aqua Modis also have about 20 years of time series. There are pros and cons of using data from these missions. Landsat has high special resolution of 30 meters, but has narrow spots, and as you can see, there are large observational gaps in between orbits. The revisit time also is low, that is 16 days, whereas MODIS has moderate special resolution of 250 meters to 1 kilometer, but has much wider spots, less gaps in between, and frequent observations 1 to 2 days. Both have moderate spectral resolution. Both sensors as well as MODIS, they have moderate spectral resolution. Landsat mission will continue. Landsat 9 is scheduled to be launched very soon this year. Terra Aqua Modis might end being operational soon, but NPP and JPSL careers will help extend this time series with comparable spatial and temporal resolution. The rear swaths are much broader uh, and there are no orbital gaps in between as you can see here. Overall, WEIRS has higher spatial resolution and more accurate measurements of sea surface temperature. It also has an operational capability for ocean power observations and products. There are several studies that have compared MODIS and WEIRS water quality products. References are given at the end of the presentation. For example, these two panels show true color images from MODIS and WEIRS and they show very similar features. A study by Lander et al. compared MODIS and WIRS products with in situ data in the Gulf of Mexico, and the figures show total backscattering at 551 nanometer from WIRS and 557 nanometer from MODIS. Their study concludes that the WIRS products will provide an adequate follow on and replacement on to MODIS for ocean color monitoring. Uncertainties found in their study uh, were primarily associated with atmospheric corrections, sampling errors such as pixel to point matchups and sea surface variation, and errors in coastal bio-optical algorithm. Now we will look at two case studies from MODIS and WIRS to help and ensure smooth transition from MODIS to WIRS for monitoring water quality. We will look at two regions. First, 
Chesapeake Bay, which is the biggest estuary in the U.S., and second, Rio de la Plata, the second biggest river basin after Amazon in South America. Today, we will learn to search and acquire Modi Sandwich Level 1 data from NASA Ocean Color website for these regions. And in subsequent sessions, we will derive water quality parameters from these Level 1 data. Next, we will have a demonstration of how to get Modi's Sandwich Level 1. Now uh, we will see how to search and download Modis and Pierce data. And for that, we are going to use Ocean Color Web. Ocean Color Web is supported by the Ocean Biology Processing Group at NASA. And there is a lot of information about Ocean Color missions. Uh, there is uh, information about this portal itself. Different missions are described here. Uh, many of them are past, but you, you can see. MODIS, OLG, uh, and VIRS uh, mission information is available here. Here is the data link that we will see in a minute. There are documentations, uh, technical reports, and user guide. There is information about file name convention. And for each mission, the file data file, they have a uh, specific convention, and that's described in here. Uh, products such as level one, two, and three, they are defined from here also. Uh, software and tools includes CDAS that we are going to see in detail in the next session. Um, and more importantly, there is a user's forum here. Once you register, you can post questions here, and um, uh, you will get answered through the forum, and you can also view other questions and answers through the forum. Before we can download data, however, there is a registration required through NASA Earth data. So if you have not already registered, here is the site, urs.earthdata.nasa.gov slash home. It's a registration site. Pick a username and password, and then you can register. Once you register with NASA Earth data, um, you can download data from any NASA data center. Going back to, so now going back to data selection, we are going to download level one data. And uh, here is level one and two browser that going to select. Once you click on it, it opens this link. Here is a window with different missions. This is temporal selection, uh, year, month, and day. And this is special selection. Let's start with temporal selection. That's the first thing to pick. Um, then let's, for example, select July. I mean, you can choose any year and month that they're available. Here now, July is highlighted. You can pick individual days, a few days, or even single day. We are just, for example, picking one month. Now you can pick Weirs and Modis, so we picked Aqua Modis and Sumi and PP Weirs here. It's selecting daytime images for ocean color because it's optical data and it's available when sun is up. Also see that you want to select swaths containing uh, at least 25% of your area of interest or 50 or more. Let's see all. So we said that we're going to pick data for Chesapeake Bay and Rio de la Plata. So for that, we want the entire region covering the swath, and those are the swaths we will download. Uh, here in special selection, uh, you can see select one or more predefined regions. And Chesapeake Bay happens to be in this list, so we can just pick Chesapeake Bay. If you don't find to area of your interest in here, then you can enter latitude and longitude and find SWAT. So that's what we're going to do for, for the river basin. Here, once you pick, you can find SWAT. And you will get a list of files. These are the files. These are Weir's files. These are Modi's files. 
you can click on individual files and that will download file on your computer but when you have many files you can order data once you this shows the region that is selected and you pick do extract my order for me and pick level one that's the data we want to download um, and uh, you will see that there are level two data available here as well but we are going to learn to convert and derive our own level two product so we're downloading level one data then once you choose all these options you review order and all these files um, they are in July 2021 where's and modus so V is for where's A for modus here uh, for this region and now you can submit order because your email address is there in the registration with NASA Earth data once you submit the order you will get a message like this uh, that we have re we have received your request for ocean color data uh, and you have to confirm so you just uh, return this mail without any uh, comment uh, and it is confirming that you've ordered this data and once you have um, confirmed that then the files are uh, selected for you and they are put uh, on on a disk where you can go and download and once the files are ready then you will receive another mail saying that your order is ready and then you can go and download the data we'll see that next next we will go through the same steps but now instead of picking the predefined region from the list we are going to enter latitude and longitude for rio de la plata uh, in this region so let's select Modis and Veers, uh, all uh, region, entire region again for July and now let this is the region that covers the river when it opens to the ocean where we want to see water quality so in this region so once you pick that again you can find swaths and it goes through the same procedure and you will get a list of files in this region so this is a 10, 10 degree by 10 degree box picked in this region you, again you can order data here it shows the region uh, where the uh, rio de la plata opens here in the ocean again we go through the same procedure um, and review order confirm submit order and then you will get a similar email that your uh, confirm order that you have ordered this data and once you send the confirmation in when the data files are ready then you will get another email um, and that is just one more step now how to download the data once you order the data uh, a few steps are left to download the data uh, you will receive a mail when your order is ready. This is, this is to inform you that the files you requested are ready to be downloaded. And you will see several links here. The one where you want to download uh, all the URLs uh, of the files that you requested. Here is the link download the manifest file. Uh, so clicking here will take you to download this manifest file it has a list of urls of the files data files that you order i already have saved this but otherwise you will save on your computer and then uh, again in the same email you will see you may direct any questions uh, please see the following page for instruction example of how to download once you click here uh, different methods are described search and download so wget and curl are most commonly used software for that um, curl uh, you have to download individual file but with wget you can use that manifest file name and all the urls that are in there uh, they will be downloaded
So that is what I have done here. Um, go to command line and type wget command. Just copy and paste from that link. And this is the manifest manifest file that we downloaded. And once you return enter the command, it downloads a file um, in which you will see uh, this is the file tar file and you will untar it so you can say tar xpf so extract file from this and these are the files now both uh, Morris and Weir's files are here and they are put in this directory after extraction. So you can look at this directory where all your files are there. And now you can use a command that is bzip2-d. So all these are open source software and you can download. So bzip2 you can use. And when you do bzip2-d, bz2, it will be uncompressed and you will get A files which are modis files and B files which are Veers files. I have already saved these files that we will be analyzing next week. And this is for GCP Bay domain. You will do the same for uh, the Rio de la Plata domain. And so these are the files. Uh, we will see how to convert level 1 to level 2. Um, and we'll do that next section. But uh, so this is this concludes a demonstration of uh, how to uh, search and download Modis and Weir's data. Well, thank you so much, Amita. We're now transitioning to the question and answer session uh, portion of today's training. So again, please do enter your questions in the Q&A box uh, that should be uh, accessible for you. And we will answer all of them. We've been getting some really terrific questions. So uh, keep them coming in and we'll answer them in the order that they were received. So we will now transition to the question and answer session portion of today's training. That's right. Uh, people, um, we have a few questions already, and um, some of them have been answered. So uh, we we will go through some of them. Uh, I'll start with the first question, and then um, Juan and Sean can also join in. Uh, so first question is: Can the cyanobacterial index be used as a proxy for chlorophyll A in turbid waters? Um, so. In, Chlorophyll A concentration is found to be associated with uh, cyanobacteria, um, harmful algal bloom. And so cyanobacteria index and chlorophyll A are positively correlated, but when there is non-alcohol turbidity is there, uh, that also affects um, phytoplankton biomass indirectly, and that is chlorophyll A. So um, it, it there's still a positive association, but how um, quantitatively, how can you say that in turbid water, uh, can you use proxy? I don't think you can use a proxy. Uh, you can sh um, see the trend in both, um, perhaps that can be used um, together. So uh, if cyanobacteria index is increasing, uh, you can say that most likely chlorophyll A might be increasing too, but it will be regulated somewhat by uh, non alcohol turbidity. Who and you, you may want to add anything to this answer, please. Uh, yeah, Amita, this is one. Hey, thanks. Uh, no, just uh, you pretty much explained it uh, very well. The one thing that I want to also mention is that remember the cyanobacteria have uh, specific pigments particularly uh, uh, phycocyanin, and uh, and sometimes these uh, uh, cyanobacteria indices, they what they uh, take into consideration is the the particular wavelength where cyano uh, phycocyanin uh, uh, reflects. Hmm. Okay, uh, Juan, 
I think I can probably take the, the, the next couple of questions in, in uh, um, uh, question number two is about the dyna in dynamic uh, coastal environments where the uh, inland influx is very high. What is the lower acceptable accuracy level? Can seasonal uh, retrieval algorithms perform better than a single algorithm? Uh, Amit Anshan, please chime in if, if, if you don't mind uh, also, but, uh, but I believe that, uh, that it will depend, the, the acceptable accuracy level will pretty much depend on the research question that needs to be answered um, you know, for a specific uh, research topic. And uh, if, but if, if the area is very dynamic, uh, then yes, it would probably be convenient to do, it's actually uh, quite uh, frequent that, that, that researchers search, uh, the researchers, they choose to do seasonal sampling if possible, and you might need to adjust the, the algorithms based on the on which season you are collecting the data, whether it's a, a rainy versus dry seasons, or if the areas, if these are, uh, Coastal or estuarine areas where there's a where there's a, a pretty big difference in between low and high tides that that might also affect your uh, your measurements. Yes, um, I think that that's correct. And uh, if you look at the published literature, you would see that depending on the coastal or estuarine area, people have. Um, have sample data algorithm are developed from weekly to monthly to seasonal. So uh, mm -hmm. it does depend on the area that you are interested in. And uh, you, you have to test that. What time period is the best for such a dynamic mm -hmm. environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I was uh, still been typing in some of the, again, uh, uh, for the, for the uh, benefit of our participants, uh, we're going to go through this document eventually. And, uh, and if, if, uh, if there are some, uh, uh, some uh, references that we can provide, uh, we will add them to the document at the end. Um, okay, question number three, uh, selling in your mind, thanks. It says, if the regression value between ground sample values and surface reflectance from satellites is low, what can the possible be the possible reasons behind it? This is a very good question. Something and something that 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 it's uh, quite often it's a uh, is an issue, and uh, and there are different factors that uh, that affect this. Um, typically, remember that. Uh, and this is one of the big differences between remote sensing, you know, satellite-based remote sensing, and, and in-situ data collection. When you do in-situ data collection, you, you're you're pretty much collecting data from one point, maybe two, three po different points uh, in your study area, and then you kind of have to extrapolate that to the to the size of the pixel. And for instance, if you if you're dealing with, let's say, either um, uh, this case for for this particular webinar, right? uh modis or beers pixels you are yeah these are on the order of uh 250 meters to one kilometer depending on the on the band and the and on the sensor and uh so there's there could be uh, uh quite a difference between let's say that particular water sample that you're taking and uh, uh whatever is happening within a one kilometer of a of a of a water of the water mass remember that uh, independently whether it's uh, in the ocean or coastal or estuarine areas usually any water masses are, are really really dynamic and, uh, and and the composition can change at any time this is actually also why it's it's very important and this is, uh, uh, relates to, to to the to the question in particular it's really really important for coastal or ocean waters or even estuarine waters to do the uh, in situ sampling I would say at least between uh, 30 minutes to an hour of the satellite overpass. Again, because uh, the uh, the this our systems are really dynamic and can change very very fast. So uh, that that is another factor that might affect your uh, regression analysis between the in situ data and the satellite data. Wow, what was the timing between the uh, 
the, the in-situ data collection, the water sampling, versus when the satellite was passing. Uh, if you if you're if if let's say if you're if there's a several hours in difference or if there's even a day or two in difference, yeah, my, 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 most most likely the the water mass have already changed or or, or will change uh, during that time. Uh, also, I one thing, a paper that uh, that I was participated with uh, with Dr. Cherry Palacios back in, in 2015, and and uh, the group of uh, UC Santa Cruz also, is that she did a, a paper uh, where she we we evaluated different uh, atmospheric correction algorithms chosen and um, for for retrieval of particularly of a uh, uh, phytoplankton functional types. And uh, I included the link there of the paper because one of, we evaluated several algorithms and, and, and compared those to the uh, to, to uh, compare the, the 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 retrieval to the to the in situ data uh, also and uh, and you might find useful that that paper. Um, yeah, back to you, Amita Ochon, for question four. So. Uh, is it possible that chlorophyll A value is high but HEP is not visible on the water surface? Um, so, it, it, when you have high chlorophyll A, it doesn't mean it's actually HEP. I think that's also is there, that it, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and I think I I, yeah. I I answered this a little bit. It's a, it will it it, it uh, you know the um, thing is that there's a there could be as we know there 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 are many organisms that can produce you know algal blooms, and uh, yeah. so there's a there's a possibility that uh, since the these uh, harmful algal blooms are very variable, they will depend on the type of organism. That is producing this. It's, it's, this goes back to the to the cyanobacteria question uh, before. Uh, yeah, and sometimes there might be particular, you know, different concentration of different nutrients or other parameters that might be more indicative or or or, or specific uh, of specific uh, algal blooms. There's the, there's a question question number five on the variable on the in the remote sensor reflectance uh, formula. Uh, what C C is a correction factor uh, uh, for for that formula, and I believe it's uh, sensor dependent, right, Amita? Yes. Yes. Uh, what are the challenges of characterizing chlorophyll A in case two waters through remote sensing? Um, so, in case to water both sedum and suspected, suspended particles, they both affect, uh, they all impact light uh, coming from water. So, it, it's hard to uh, retrieve chlorophyll A in, in, in these waters. But in in last several years, I mean, there's quite a few studies um, in different areas, uh, people have used in situ data of serum and uh, suspended matter and chlorophyll A and derive uh, all kinds of algorithms. So, what we will do is we'll try and add a few references later on um, that you can refer to different combinations of different um, wavelengths, frequencies for neutral wavelengths are used. Um, and so I will definitely provide you references how to deal with that. It it, it seems to, it, it depends on on the case to water that you are looking at. So it it the algorithms will not be uniformly valid for all regions. So that's why I guess having in situ data along with uh, remote sensing data. And and I think Juan mentioned this that when you have um, overpass data, right when you have in situ data, if you have many such cases, then it is a, it is a, you can develop algorithm for your own reach or case to work.
Here's a question number seven uh, about how does one solve the problem of Lanza Lake, uh, Lanza Seven, the, the, uh, particularly the the problem with the, the, the stripping lines, uh, <clears throat> and um, if the stripping lines are replaced by lines from different time acquisition, then the time series analysis won't be valid. Yeah, there's no easy way around this. Uh, and I believe uh, here's a link that uh, Mita provided uh, from the USGS that uh, that can help with uh, with that particular issue. Yes. So uh, I think you don't want to replace those lines with some other time. Uh, but uh, this is this algorithm is worth looking at that USGS has uh, provided. Or also the 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 alternative yeah. would be to if 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 you can if you can avoid using the the Landsat seven data you can you can still use uh, you know Landsat five or eight. Five and eight, yeah, yeah. So people have done that, uh, not use seven, but use five and eight. Mm -hmm. So question eight is in order to improve the special resolution of data, is it possible to assess coastal water quality using inclusion? Images or pan, pan sharpen. Um, so, so yes, I uh, there are studies. Uh, people have used pan sharpen data to increase special resolutions. So for Lancet also, and then there are commercial data which are high resolution. They they are used for this. Is still a research question. It's a research problem. I don't think it's operationally used pan sharpen data for monitoring. For, Question nine, uh, one, I think uh, uh, I'm not sure about this, whether the same remote sensing techniques can be used for inland wetlands. I, there, I'm not uh, sure with optical data. Yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, I, well, for one thing, yeah, for instance, in this case, we're talking about bodies and bears in particular, so that it would depend on the size also of the of the of the wetland, right? If if we're talking about a, uh, you know uh, an area that is relatively small, it would be it would, the, those are going to be the influence of uh, of uh, of the uh, surrounding areas. So that's something to take not only to consider in this case, but but in general too. When you're dealing with uh, with uh, wetlands or or uh, different types of uh, estuarine areas, uh, we did uh, what I what I would say is that uh, we actually did uh, when was uh, two years ago we did uh, a webinar on particularly on remote sensing of freshwater ecosystems and uh, and we can refer our participants to to that uh, specific webinar and there might be also some uh, useful information. Uh, there uh, for them. So we'll, we, we can provide the link to, to that webinar here. Yeah, that's great. So question 10 is, the coastal waters having a lot of freshwater flux, influx are always turbid. And the, the, the there's always raised questions, okay, so the accuracy of satellite data, what should I do in that? Case. So, yeah, I think that is really the biggest challenge in coastal waters. Um, but if you have in situ measurements, ideally frequent and dense near coastal zones, uh, for example, in the Chesapeake Bay, there is a very well point and developed uh, measurement of uh, water sampling program going on. And so, if you have uh, enough in situ measurements, then first of all, to develop uh, develop algorithms and to validate uh, satellite based water quality parameters, that would certainly help. That would actually uh, help you define what kind of accuracies you can get. And then that something reviewers may be convinced if you have enough uh, in situ data to compare with. So that is why it, it's um, coastal regions are difficult. It, it's not same everywhere, uh, but 
but estuaries and areas where you have, like Gulf of Mexico, um, Chesapeake Bay in California also, when there, you have in-situ measurements, there's a better algorithm development and validation that helps in defining accuracy of your algorithm. Uh, can I use the SNAP tool for processing ocean color data as a replacement for CDAS? Um, it's both SNAP and CDAS are based on Beam, but uh, I will have to check whether SNAP has been used for processing ocean color data. I'm not sure. I can probably take uh, number 12 here. Uh, <clears throat> talks about how effective are these uh, satellite images to identify the nature of suspended part uh, sediment particles in estuarine environments. And, uh, and I would say that applies to not only estuarine environments, but also uh, coastal environments in, in, in general. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, if the idea is to reduce uh, particle size on, or composition, uh, I don't think that's usually possible with satellite data. Um, uh, there might be there. Are, um, there, are, there are not that many algorithms actually available for for total suspended sediments. Um, usually, vertical attenuation coefficient and other parameters are used for uh, for estimating turbidity in the in specific areas. Um, but I did include it there a recent paper. Um, it just came out this last year in 2020 uh, that describes how to retrieve uh, total suspended solids from uh, from satellite data, and they actually they uh, used a different uh, uh, a number of of different uh, uh, sensors data from from different sensors, including Sentinel. Uh, so the uh, ocean land color instrument, Orchi, uh, Modis, Beers, and even Landsat also, and they compared how the algorithm uh, uh, worked or uh, how effective it was with, with with them. So I would definitely refer our our participants to to that uh, specific um, uh, paper, which could be very very useful. It came out it just came out last year in remote sensing of the environment. Okay. So uh, question 13, why are we using the Ocean Color Portal and why not use a platform such as Google Earth Engine? And yes, we, we can. Actually, um, when we do um, an advanced webinar where we will be working with data, perhaps we will switch to Google Earth Engine, but the reason we chose Ocean Color Portal is because it, it is specifically for Ocean Color data. So all the images, level one, two, uh, and three, all are there. And um, so it's like one place where you have data and software, all information. So that's why we chose Ocean Color Portal. Question 14 is, is there a page with examples of the scripts to download and process images in Python or R? Uh, there are. Uh, several, but uh, we'll have to look for them. Uh, with NASA DAX, uh, they do have um, Python scripts to download and process images, but um, what we are doing this time is rather than using Python code or any code, we are using graphical user interface. So, so backend is Python is there, but we are not going to actually work with the code. I would like to know if we need to keep these files ready for the next session. So if you want to try it, yes, but it is not it is not required. This is just for the information, and and we actually are planning an advanced webinar very soon. So uh, 
this webinar actually is kind of will be preparations for that. So then we actually will download files and work with data and develop our own algorithms. Uh, but this time, if you want to follow along, uh, that would be great, but it's not required uh, for the webinar. So now one, you want to talk about question 16, uh, which wavelengths can be used for detection of chlorophyll in turbid water? Um, I, I, you know, we will provide a few references here because there are a variety of algorithms in combination of uh, wavelengths are used to detect chlorophyll uh, in turbid water. So we will we'll provide that. So how is turbidity different from suspended sediments? <laughs> um. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I said before, there's a there, and uh, and again, I would probably refer our participant to the same paper that I that I just mentioned a while ago, because um, there's no easy way to 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 measure, uh, particularly you know, total suspended sediments in the water with remote sensing data. Um, uh, that's why we use other parameters such as uh, vertical attenuation coefficients and uh, among others. Um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, turbidity. When when we talk about turbidity in general, it's uh, as a concept. It it not only relies on just suspended sediments, or so pretty much every anything that it's that is in the water column will will affect the, the turbidity of the water column, or at least the penetration of water of of light within the the water column. So uh, suspended sediments are one component. I would probably say. Uh, you know, out of uh, all the others that are that affect the uh, uh, light penetration in the in the water column. So, question seventeen is in terms of resolution. If you have to pick one, which one would that be? Spectral, spatial, or temporal? Um, that's that's an interesting question because having all three high is not that common or easy. Um, for algorithm development, I think spectral and spatial resolutions play a big role. But then uh, temporal resolution is important if you if you're looking for specific features, mm -hmm. so, say, uh, algal bloom or hypoxia, if you're looking for or looking for, then, then temporal resolution also matters. But if you have to pick one, I think for algorithm development, it is special and spectral resolution that helps, uh, provided that you have in situ data when the satellite overcomes. So that so somewhere there temporal resolution also matters. Mm -hmm. And if I may, uh, Amita, um, mm -hmm. this uh, this also is, you know it's a highly dependent on on what is the research question. Uh, to be answered, and also the what is your your particular area of interest? Because, um, uh, for instance, if you're looking, if you're working in a in a very small area, when then spatial resolution in particular is is a, it becomes important when choosing uh, 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 a, a particular type of a, of a, of remotely sensed data, uh, right? So. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it also depends on your on your on your research question, and then also you know, like you said, in tempo, terms of a temporal resolution, it's uh, it's important, particularly if you're uh, dealing with a system that is highly dynamic, and uh, there's something to be considered whether the system is uh, is affected by seasonal changes, for instance, um, among other factors.
question in 18 is, are the methods used in the presentation being used in inland water monitoring? Uh, yes, they are uh, used in inland waters also. Um, ARSAT did a webinar to get to water quality in inland lakes, and we'll provide link here. Uh, you can refer to that, but more or less same procedure. Procedures are used in inland uh, lakes also. But what matters is uh, the size of the lake and spatial resolution of, of the satellite data. So you, you have to have enough pixels in the lake uh, so that they're, they are not contaminated by the, the coastal region or they're clearly in, inside the lakes, a number of pixels. So that depends on the size of the lake and, and also on size size of the pixel that you have. So those are the things to consider. But, but procedures can be used. Question 19, is the Landsat 7 special resolution data readily available? Um, yes, I think all Landsat data are openly available. With this satellite, is it possible to cover the region around Angola? So yes, Modis and Weirs both are the global observations are there. So around Angola, yes, Landsat also. All the satellites we talked about, they would cover area around Angola. How does one deal with NAN value data, especially for matchup analysis of CHA? This is, I, I don't understand if you're talking about NAN, this appearing in CDAS or OCSSW, um, or is it reflectance? I'm not sure. If, if it is, say, say, cloudy or if it is uh, very turbid or it's shallow water pixel, then sometimes um, or sometimes atmospheric correction fails, so then you would not have water leaving deflectances and you will have not number there. And in that case, you cannot match it with, with in situ core of PA. I, I assume that's what you're asking. So for, for any number of reasons, you might not get water leaving reflectance. So then there is no way you can match it with in situ in A. So you have to find a cloud, relatively cloud-free pixel, uh, not uh, in too shallow water, so that you have water leaving deflectance data that you, you can match with in situ data. Uh, I'll just go in the link. To, yes, question 22. The answer is yes. The links are provided. Every, everything we did, it is uh, available online through those links. Uh, but I, there, there is a simpler way of downloading this data. Anyone you, you may want to mention that. We went through a lengthy, um, we use WGAT and Perl, but I think there is a way you can just download the data on your computer without doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, <clears throat> or at least for those of us who are not that uh, friendly with, <laughs> with coding, um, when you get the so as Amita mentioned in the in the demonstration, you you will find you will get the access to the manifest. And the manifest, pretty much what it does is that is it provides a, a a a link to for downloading the 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 compressed data. So the the easy way around it. Uh, and I tried it, and, uh, and it, at least it, it worked for me. Was that instead, if you want, if you don't want to go through the WGET uh, process that Amita mentioned in the in the uh, demonstration, 
you can copy the the link provided in the manifest in the text document you can pro you can copy it to the to a web browser and uh when, once you hit enter it will uh it will literally download the the uh the the compressed file the tar file uh to your to your local drive and then from there you can use any 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 of the uh decompressing <coughs> uh software available um the the one that Amita mentioned or even if you have 7 zip or something like that you can you can use it to 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 decompress the file and have access to the to the to the individual um uh images so that is the the easy way around it So question 23 is, do you think accurate time series prediction for watch quality parameters is possible as these parameters change drastically over time and also in space? So when you say prediction, I believe that what you're saying is that once you develop uh, algorithm and coefficients, can you use them for, for future uh, with other times like satellite data as time goes, can you use the same model forever? So it can happen, you can do that if you have sufficiently large training period to develop your algorithm, that you have covered many possible cases of um, you know, drastically changing parameters in space and time. So if you have model or model that, then there's a good chance that your algorithm will be effective. Um, so times in this prediction or what the parameters may be more believable and accurate. But if you have a very short training period, so say if you just uh, develop algorithm based on one season of data, then can you use that in other seasons? Most likely not. So so it, it so training period if that covers that diversity of parameters, then there's a good chance that you can use that for prediction. And question 24 is, are the data from Moody's and Wills free from atmospheric interference noise? Um, so when, no, when you look at data from Moody's and Wills, it's top of atmosphere radiances that are measured. So or reflectances, so they, they have to be corrected for atmospheric effects. Can we measure salinity and sea dome in shallow inland lakes that are six meters deep and six miles long? Um, 20 feet deep. So um, sea dome, uh, you can, if you have in situ data, then you can try and develop an algorithm. Salinity, I don't think you can get it from remote sensing for this size of lake. There are experimental missions, they, they provide salinity, but uh, I'm not sure whether you can, you can there, are, there are operational satellites that could give you salinity. Mm -hmm. That is no, correct, I don't, I don't, at least for, for this size, um, I don't, haven't seen any any uh you no know, mission with that resolution for for salinity in particular can we take real-time monitoring at night so we are using optical data and uh, that we're looking at reflected sunlight basically so at night uh, it would not be possible you need daytime images. You can use infrared data for certain parameters, but not all. Question 27, while developing the algorithm, how can we compensate when we miss one ocean color component? Um, so, I guess the key is that you, you, if you know the situation with the water that you're dealing with, 
then perhaps you can say that okay for this particular water body it's okay if we, if we don't have this particular water body parameter but i don't know whether there's any general method to compensate for something that's missing yeah the only thing that comes to mind is that some if that you can somehow model that specific parameter but uh, but it, it will be complicated because again it changes it might ch just change you know uh continuously so question 28 how is point data incorporating incorporated into special data for water monitor so um, yeah that is just basically you are matching the point data with pixel data that's that is there um, so it's simple just um, if a pixel if a satellite overpass is there and if a pixel uh, covers that point where you have in situ data that same that same co-located data Data. Obviously, point data and pixel resolution are different, but that's the way they're matched. We, Amita, correct me if I'm wrong, but we'll probably be showing some of this in the if we do the when we do the the advanced. Uh, webinar maybe later this year. At least they'll, they'll be able to see, you know, see bus uh, to some extent. Yes. yes, yeah, we we will definitely do that. Um, there, uh, where we match uh, in situ data with satellite data. So we'll do. We actually will refer to you a couple of our set webinars we did that, and we'll we are planning on in near future also. So how to verify an oil leak and alcohol flow? I think they both would have different spectral characteristics. So in optical data, right? One, I think. Yeah, most likely. Most likely. Yeah. You know, an oil leak will it's uh, um most times it's really, really dark and then an algae bloom will reflect in, in different wavelengths. Why do we use MODIS data for water quality analysis? Why not use Sentinel data because it has better special resolution? So um, when you say Sentinel, I'm sure you are you you're referring to MS Sentinel 2 multi-spectral imager, which definitely has high resolution and yes, could be used, should be used for uh, water quality analysis. The reason we are looking at MODIS is because it has a long time series. So MSI started very recently. So if for near real time monitoring, um, yes, you can use MSI. Uh, but if you are trying to see how water quality has changed over time, you want to look at trends, especially in coastal regions where climate impact is, is there. Then for longer time series, we are, we are looking at modes. And that, uh, so if you remember the slide where we showed that Landsat also has a long time series, but that has uh, the temporal resolution is low as well as that is swaths, which are narrow. So that way, uh, modes, although moderate resolution, it, it uh, has frequent coverage, it is long term, it is 20 years. That's what we're looking at, notice. And more importantly, all uh, fears will actually continue in this time series. So then we'll have longer time series. Since you mentioned Sentinel, there is Sentinel 3 that has also a moderate resolution sensor, it's called OLG. And that also has been used to monitor water quality, which is similar to what is in resolution. Does it make sense to apply data from these satellites and methodology on an area less than 
five square kilometers. So uh, for uh, there is there is empirical uh, analysis done by some scientists from NOAA that if you have three pixels in in a lake or in a water body, clearly within the water body, um, you can perhaps uh, use that to to get water quality from that water body. So five kilometers where if you use MSI or Landsat, you probably uh, can use this methodology. Question 32, I'm not sure I understand. Um, let's go back to question 3. Is the regression? Ah, uh, yeah. Juan, you want to address question 32? Let me see. It says, follow up on question 3, if the regression value between ground sample is low, what can be the possible reason? OK. Does it mean that graph samples can be used with sensor data to understand longer influences example of pollution source that it's changing uh, water quality over time due to a spill but may also be uh, dissipating quickly um, you can yeah it, it pretty much go, goes back to to what i mentioned before um, obviously things to be considered are the satellite overpass and make sure that you are if you if the if the idea is to relate the in situ data with the satellite the remotely sensed data definitely you need to consider the satellite overpass and to pretty much be on site uh, at the same time as when the satellite is is, is flying over um, otherwise as the participant exactly you know sex sex uh, correctly if uh, if it is um, if there's a chance that the your uh, your uh, event is uh, dissipating quickly you will probably miss it uh, and then and then there's going to be a, there's gonna, going to be a, a, probably a, a very good a very uh, big difference between the your in situ and satellite uh, uh, data so um yeah, that it's a it's, it's something to be to, to definitely keep in mind that uh, that you need you need to be there on site uh, to to the extent possible you know uh, and uh, right when when the satellite is is, is overpassing particularly if it's um, an event as the what it's mentioned in the in the question that it's uh, that could be could could dissipate relatively quickly. Also, uh, uh, as a reminder, if it's something that it dissipates really quickly, uh, the satellite will, will 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 fly over maybe once a day, uh, or, or once every couple of days. Uh, so there's also a chance uh, that it might just miss it. And also there's a, depending on the size of the event, um, if there are clouds, remember that we're dealing with, with optical data, if there are clouds, uh, <clears throat> Uh, right above the, the the event, then then you will get uh, you know uh, null values or negative values. And uh, 33, I will probably stop here just because of uh, of uh, we're uh, running short on time. But again, we're going to address all these questions in the final document. Thanks again for providing them. Um, can you measure eutrophication using remote sensing? Uh, yeah, most most times it's uh, chlorophyll A mm -hmm. is a classical uh, you know <clears throat> measure that is. That you can relate with uh, with eutrophication with increasing nutrients, you can expect to have a, an increase in the in the phytoplankton communities when, uh, with an increase in, in eutrophication. Uh, I don't know if you have any any other anything else, Amita or Sean. 
No, I think that that's why eutrophication is basically if you have chlorophyll A and if you are able to see adductor BDT or suspended uh, particles, that that would indicate eutrophication. So yes. Mm -hmm. So I will just take a couple of questions. It's already uh, time is up. But does chlorophyll A and C don't interfere with one another? So yes, they do. And as we mentioned earlier, we will find a few references where people have uh, tried to, to look at different um, spectral ratios of reflectances to, to see which one dominates serum or chlorophyll A. So then okay, why aqua modis products are used uh, more for SST and chlorophyll than Terra? So, um, as the name suggests, aqua modis is for water and terra is more for land, I believe, but uh, also it's the overpass time. Uh, their equator crossing times are different, and so aqua modis is better for uh, SC and chlorophyll. Uh, question 36. Um, how much has the amount of plastic debris in course of water affected remote sensing uh, responses interpretation? Also, is there any potential for identifying floating plastic using fields? Um, I am not sure whether plastic debris has been seen from the satellites. Hmm. There's a uh, in the uh, in in the uh, remote sensing of coastal environments uh, seminar from from last year. I provided a a, a couple of uh, links to some papers which I will add here, and they they there's uh, the recent studies from 2018 <clears throat> from from Garaba and Dearson and also from from Acuna, Rus et al., and both in remote sensing of the environment. And uh, they they didn't use uh, VIRS in particular, but they, what they, some of them, particularly Acuna, Rus, what they did is that they modeled by, by using, by collecting uh, <clears throat> spectral data from from plastics in in the in several beaches, then they modeled what would be the signal for worldview in particular in this case. Um, again, because worldview has a much, much higher spatial resolution um, than the bears. But uh, yeah, I'll be uh, adding those links to uh, to this uh, answer and they, they could be useful for our participants. So question 37, how much of time interval should be considered between collecting data in situ with the satellite overpass. So ideally, I think currently, uh, and correct me if I have only one, I think it is a few hours window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually, if possible at all, um, uh, it would be, be better, uh, particularly for uh, correlation and validation of the, of the, of the satellite uh, remotely sensed data if the in situ uh, data can be collected, I would say within 30 minutes to an hour, plus or minus uh, of the satellite overpass. So before, yeah, before, after the satellite, 30 minutes to an hour before, after the satellite overpass. So um, I think we are almost past our webinar time, so we, what we will do is we will answer the questions that are not um, answered yet. We and, and the question answer document will be available online uh, later on. So we are going to close the webinar um, for now. And we really want to thank you all for attending today's session. And we hope to see you Thursday in, in like the date of on 16th, um, the same time for 
for, for analysis of the images that we have uh, downloaded today. So thanks for attending today's uh, session. And we want to uh, also thank our RSET team for helping. Um, Juan and Sean McCartney, we all of us, we thank uh, Prof. Levins, uh, Selwyn Hudson Otoy, and Jonathan O'Brien for their help in organizing this webinar. So thanks, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you on Thursday in, on 16th, same time. Have a great day. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone.